100% about to be sold and destroyed. And it was, and the Granges are a community center for farmers unions. Like, no bankers are allowed in the building. It's like one of the rules. It's been around since the 1800s. The Grange organization has let women vote 50 years before women could vote legally in our constitution. It's a really rad organization. We wanted to keep this building safe. So for five years, we like spent our, our year long working on these posters, and then in the summer, we have people come to our house for this thing called the work party. And for five years, the work party was like learning about politics and working on posters and learning how to refurbish a historical building. So after five years, we got this building fixed. And it's back on the historic registry in Maine. It's gorgeous. And it's reopened now for community events, art shows. The Grangers still have their meetings there. Um, we actually won the Maine Historical Society Preservation Award, which is weird that we got that, but we did. And every year we have this huge party called Black Fly Ball to celebrate the reopening of this building. And this year it was our fifth annual Black Fly Ball. And we still have the work party, even though today it's not necessarily about fixing the Grange, it's about community organizing and learning to live collectively and things like that. But we can't live in a community center. So we faced the funny problem of we needed to move out of the community center and find a new place to live. And we had earned trust with the community. After five years, we made a bunch of friends who were real estate agents and bankers who helped us get a ridiculous loan based on poster sales to buy this building, which is the Clark Perry House. It's our weird mansion that we live in now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? We live on an acre of land. Um, in the middle of town, lots of lots of organizations will get a house outside of town and like make their own new world and like have like a ranch. But we decided that we wanted to be right in the middle of town um, where we were really visible. So our interactions with our town are like a whole nother story to the Beehive other than the posters. But the hilarious part about this building is our other building was made um, for the people, right? It's for farmers. It was for um, community organizing. It's what that building was intended for. This building was the house, the mansion built for the lumber baron of Washington County. This is the person personally responsible for deforesting the whole area that we live in. Yeah, we live in his house. Um, and that's kind of a joke that the, the, the town thought was hilarious and that's why we have the house. But we live there collectively. And we, and we make our decisions in our organization based on consensus. This means that every single person has to agree. It's not, it's not a majority rule where if one person disagrees, like, you're out of luck, everyone else thinks this is a good idea. We take the time to understand why that extra person doesn't want to go through with this, and usually our decisions are better because we include every single person in the process. We don't have a boss, that's the idea, that nobody in our organization is more in charge than anybody else. We, are all, we all have the same amount of responsibility. And... Little known story about the Beehive is that we started 10 years ago as a stone mosaic making collective. Actually, before the posters, we made these big crazy mosaics. And uh, the thing about the mosaics is that we use this old Italian technique where we actually cut the stones to make the shapes we wanted. As opposed to breaking a stone and using the broken pieces, we cut them, which is incredibly tedious. And in fact, didn't ever think we could find something more tedious to do until we started making posters. <laughs> and the, the posters began as a side project amongst this, this mural project. And over time, the posters like, blew up. People wanted the posters. They sold out instantly. People wanted them and asked for them. And it sort of took over the idea of these mosaics. The mosaics were celebrating biodiversity. They celebrated um, like the rich genetic like how in, in the ecosystem there's all different kinds of one kind of animal. But it was really sort of, we, we realized that the mosaics were only for the people who could buy them, right? And who can buy a mosaic but a very, very rich person. And so these mosaics, no matter how beautiful they were, people weren't seeing them as much. And so that's how these posters sort of took over. All of it has this sort of thread that connects all these ideas because the BI Collective, we are geeked out about looking at the microcosm and the macrocosm at the same time. We make these posters that are sort of these uh, us yelling no as loud as we can against these really big global issues that perhaps we're not gonna see the change in our lifetime. And that can really burn a person out. You, get, you, you might get discouraged after enough time. And so to recharge our batteries, we 
we also work in our community. We work, we rebuilt the community center. We do community organizing. And that, being able to see the way that our actions affect our town and working globally and traveling all across the United States to talk about it, those things at the same time really balance us. The way that each tiny piece of stone makes an image, the way that each animal that exists in an ecosystem makes up the biodiversity, and the way that every tiny cartoon animal on that poster represents a small part of a giant issue that you can see all at once if you look at this poster. That's what we're all about. Here, I'm just gonna take you through some of our older posters really fast. This is our first poster in 2001, talking about how genetically modified corn is fatal to monarch butterflies, and it had a whole bunch of text, right? There's like words all over it. And it was only talking about one particular thing. And our next poster decided, well, let's zoom out and let's try to understand how that one particular thing fits into a larger idea. This one was about biotechnology. So genetically modified corn is just one part of the story of us deciding as humans to go in and edit the DNA of things and, and, and change the life structure and, and how that played out in our society. And this kind of looks a lot like a comic book. And you'll see that in the middle there's this dude right here. And one thing you're gonna notice looking at our posters is this, is this is the last time we ever drew a person. We stopped drawing people after this. Our images, standard, do not have humans in them. Does anybody have any idea why we, why we would not draw humans? Because it's not a metaphor. Exactly, it would be a metaphor, it'd be pretty literal. And by, <laughs> exactly. and by not drawing metaphors, we're avoiding drawing a couple of things. Any idea that we're avoiding drawing? Stereotypes. Stereotypes. Like what? What are stereotypes? Let's think of some. Maybe like what size you are. What else do you get stereotypes? What color you are. What color you are? Gender. What gender you are? Anything else? Class. Your class, exactly. Your age, perhaps. Right. All of these things that people are in our culture find themselves defined by. We're, we're avoiding all of that. We're also avoiding like a time period. And we're not drawing politicians, we're drawing the system, right? So George Bush isn't in any of our posters. A lot of the things that his, like his eight years in office, the things that happened during that time, those are his posters. But not him, because it's not actually about George Bush. It's about a whole bunch of other things, right? So this next poster is the first one where we stop drawing humans. And this is hard to see, it's that one over there. We'll, we'll turn the lights up and take some closer looks in a minute, but this one, it's explained free trade. And it started telling the story without the use of it, at pretty much as little words as possible. It was our first real narrative poster. And it was requested of us, people asked us, can you please make this? The next request that we got was for the Plan Colombia, another direct request. And this is when we decided that we would go to Colombia. And instead of just doing research, we would go there and ask people what to say. And this works also as a narrative. We realize that we have to tell the story in chapters and we have to tell the story of the history that led us to this point because it's not just about what's happening. What's happening right now is just one chapter in the very long story of what humans have been doing for a long time. So it reads top to bottom and left to right. And then we started this other poster, which I, we want to show this to you because it's still in progress. This poster is the Plan Colombia, excuse me, that was the last one. It used to be called the Plan Puebla Panama, also known as Mesoamerica Resiste, because the Plan Puebla Panama was a mega development plan in the isthmus of, uh, excuse me, from, in Central America. It's like this mega development, huge highways, huge pipelines, um, pretty much systems that are going to get natural resources from South America to North America and back and forth. And uh, it changed its name recently to Project Mesoamerica, so now we call the poster Mesoamerica Resiste. But what this poster does is it's two-sided. It starts closed and it opens up. We don't have a picture of the inside to show you because it's all so sketchy, you can't see it yet. But the idea is that on the front it's all the bad news and then when you open the poster it's all the good news. And it has taken us over seven years at this point to work on that poster. And the front of the poster explains the story of colonization, 500 years of colonization. And it has all of these characters on it that talk about the different systems that have existed for 500 years that have set into place the things we have today. Like here's the Inter-American Development Bank, shown as a conquistador. 
Then it's got the ATM Bulldog, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, we show these boats um, on this sort of old, old explorer's map that are imports and exports from North America and South and Central America. Uh, what's this guy? So you what this is. It's the cultural imperialism. What do we see on it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Each of them are two different things, right? So this one's Scrooge McDuck and Uncle <laughs> Sam. This one is Joe Camel and And this one's Bart Simpson and it's hard to see Superman. Anyways, <laughs> that's one of sorry, that's not that's right. The idea being that that's one of the many things that comes from our country to other countries. We have and then on the inside of the poster, there's over 400 individual characters, and each character is a different species which means there are 72 types of ants, and each ant is a different ant, identifiable by its markings. So it's kind of like our opus, but hopefully will be done um, quite soon. And the inside shows all different scenes of resistance, active things that are happening right now to resist Project Mesoamerica. Anyways, this is the poster that we're talking about. It is so big that we have to make scaffolding just to draw on it. Um, wish us a lot to check out our website or talk to me later if you're interested in this project. Um, there's a lot more to say about it, but I want to make sure we don't take too long. Now, we make these posters, right? We make these huge posters. And what do we do with them when we're done? We don't just say, ta-da, they're done. Actually, we have to do a whole lot more. The work that we do with the posters is almost similar to a political campaign. We travel all over the country and to other countries when we can afford it to tell the stories of the posters. They're just tools, right? They're educational like maps that we can have conversations with people and talk about politics in a way that's not boring. So we go everywhere. We go to high schools like this. Um, this is a scene from a couple years ago, one of our tours. We also go to mass mobilizations and festivals. Here are the Common Ground Fair. It's the largest organic uh, festival in our country. Super fun. We go to um, the SOA protest every year, which is a school of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. I don't know if you guys go to that. We have megaphones and giant versions of the banner. We, we will yell in the streets as fast as we can. We only have five minutes of people's attention span to get a story into their brain. And then we'll also go into like more intimate settings in colleges, and universities, and community centers, birthday parties, bat mitzvahs, <laughs> maybe not so much last days. <laughs> anywhere we can go, anywhere we can go to tell these stories, we go. And um, we also go places um, that aren't so typical. So here you see, this is a trip that was made a couple years ago. One of our bees went to Colombia and Venezuela and spent um, over two years there returning the poster to the folks that had been spoken to on the original research trip. And many times he went to schools where the children didn't speak Spanish or English, and those are the only two languages he spoke. And so he had to find new ways to communicate with the posters without being able to speak to the children. And one of the things that he did was he would have them find a part in the poster that they could, that they could like resonate with, a part of the poster that mattered to them because this poster was their story. And then they would take that image and they would draw their own version. Yeah. And then he taught them how to screen print. And then they made their own t-shirt. Oh. I know, it's true. Really awesome. <laughs> the point being that we are striving to make art that is affordable, that is fun. We do not make something that is a million dollars that hangs in someone's, some rich person's living room. We want our art to be for anyone who can get their hands on it. And we make it available as much as possible. Everything that our organization makes is sliding scale donation. I mean, this kid came up to me once and was like, I really want a poster, I don't have any money, but I found this badger tooth. Can I trade you for a poster? And the answer is yes. It's important for you to have a poster. That's really weird. Don't give me that back to you. The point being that art is fun, and politics doesn't have to be confusing, and that anyone can tell the story of this poster, and anybody can participate in global issues. 
Um, and that's why we do what we do. Yeah. For, um, just first of all, when was this started? Sure. So this this is our newest one. We finished it about four months ago at the beginning of the summer. It took us about two and a half years to make. And um, yeah, so it took us about, you know, so it started well, two and a half, three years ago is when we started the project. We finished it at the beginning of the summer and we finally printed it. And um, for those who maybe missed the beginning of our presentation, what our poster what makes our poster, I think, really special is that we're, we are acknowledging that we're storytellers. And so that these stories are not our stories. I didn't, I don't live in Appalachia and I haven't learned that story firsthand. And so we do research trips where we go and do listening projects to hear what stories people want us to tell. And we were able to go back with this story several times so people could tell us that like we were doing it wrong and we needed to fix it or that we were doing it right. And so this poster is based on people telling us, yes, you're telling this story correctly. So, so the story starts right here in the middle with the site of mountaintop removal coal mining, which is happening in Appalachia, particularly in West Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, and Kentucky. And it's a type of coal mining that blows up mountains. And so we describe the mountain, which you can see right here, as a birthday cake. On the top of your birthday cake, you have candles or trees. And then you have cake, which is like this thick layer of bedrock right here. And then you have icing, which is this thin layer of coal. Right? And so the coal company is coming to your birthday party. They're uninvited. They're showing up anyway. You ask them to leave. They still don't leave. And then they knock off all of your birthday candles. They throw them on the floor. And they knock off the cake and they throw that on the floor. And they lick up that thin stream of icing, which is the coal. And that's all they're after. And in that process, they've ruined your entire birthday cake. Probably your birthday party. So, what we see here is them actually blowing up a mountain, physically blowing up a mountain. And what they, they, do, they use these big machines called a drag line to scrape up the mountain and scrape up all of those rocks. And this drag line is so big, they have to build it on site. It can be up to 20 stories high. And this bucket that you see can hold up to three Greyhound buses. So the scale that we're talking about is crazy. Over 470 named mountains have been destroyed by Mount Chakra. And what they do with all the rocks that they're not using and all the trees that they also don't use. They don't sell it to a timber company because that's going to slow down their process and be too expensive. And so what they do is they just dump all of that into the valley. They call it a valley. And so here we see a valley in between two mountains, what used to be two mountains, being filled up. And they use that earthen, that earth to make an earthen dam. And what they put behind that dam is something called smudge which is a, a product that you get when you clean, when you wash the coal. Because coal, because the Clean Air Act, is too dirty to just burn. It's going to put too much pollution in there. And so they clean it, they wash it using water and chemicals. But what they do with that water afterwards is they put it behind these earthen dams. Some of the largest earthen dams in the world are found in Appalachia, and they're not made to last forever. It's just rocks piled up. And behind it is billions and billions of gallons of water that is now thick black goo that's filled with things like mercury and arsenic, super poisonous to us. And so they fill it, they fill it up, and they just have billions of gallons of it there. But to start to understand why this is allowed and why it's so absurd that we're blowing up these mountain ranges, we have to look way back and start talking about why these mountains. Amazon region. And so what happened is once the ice is melted, 
These became the seed beds that then repopulated all this desolate land that had been cut up over that period of time. Um, and so through these mountains, you can see here, it runs this, this stream of clear, beautiful water. And so the other reason why the Appalachian Mountains are really so special and important to us is they provide the, they are the watershed that provides drinking water for a lot of the southeastern seaboard of the US, to drinking water for Washington, D.C., for Charlotte, for Atlanta, right down to Mobile and across to the Mississippi in the southeast. All get their drinking water from this region. And it is a huge amount of water is pumped out from these, these mountains every day. And so part of the reason why the water is so clear brings us to the story of coal. So deep in the mountains, we have a large amount of this substance, coal. But what is coal? Does anyone know what coal is? Yeah, so it's carbon. Yeah, that's right. So you're both absolutely right. Further back in time, we were trying to call it the carboniferous period. So there's a huge amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And the plants of the time that we see, the ancestors of these plants today, we see in ferns, club mosses, and horsetails. But at the time, they grew taller than trees, and they were sucking in um, solar energy from the sun, and through photosynthesis, growing and storing all that energy. But they were also sucking in all the carbon from the atmosphere and toxins from the water. And so over time, the plants would die and fall down. And this process happened over and over. So you have this piling up of these huge plants. And at the time, the bacteria was um, not yet... Um, it was like a teenage bacteria. It learned how to fully break down stuff, as we see happen today with the compost and stuff. And so over time, it's compacted and compressed millions of years of stored solar energy. So this is why coal is so extremely powerful, is because all that solar energy that has been stored in the coal is released in the instant when we burn it. But it's also the reason why coal is so dirty, because all that carbon and all the toxins that it's been growing, growing out of the environment to create a world that we all the creatures and the plants that we live with exist gets released from the environment. But it is, and it's still doing today what it is then, drawing the toxins out of the water. So it's like that earth's giant natural river water purifies the water for it. Yeah, when we leave it in the ground, once we take it out, it becomes super toxic. But if we leave it in the ground, in the mountains where it's always been and where it's existed and evolved as part of the earth, then it's doing a really great service. And that's how it happens. But as you can see here, as we, there's also these seeds where you can start to see as we're moving in history, we can start to see these seeds of colonization. And here we've got these European starlings we're bringing with them music and the cultural tools that they all have so displacing and Farming, the cocaine, but a lot of people were also people's personal farms and homes. 
And so, people are forced to leave. They have to go to the city to get a new job. And a lot of this land becomes abandoned. And who comes in afterwards conveniently on this now abandoned land? But all of these mosquitoes. And these mosquitoes are sucking up natural resources. Can we see what they're sucking up? Oil. Colombia has the ninth largest oil reserves on our planet. And um, almost all of their oil goes directly to us. There's also, let's see, there's Nestle. It's sucking up sugar and cocoa. And co not cocoa, cocoa. It's big chocolate. We see the Coca-Cola. Um, mosquitoes over there sucking up pure water. Now, here's the funny thing. There's this campaign. It's called the Killer Coke Campaign. You can look into it. And Coke, right there, it says Coca, not Coca-Cola, because one of the original ingredients in Coca-Cola was the Coke. It was originally a brain tonic. And for a very long time, Coca-Cola was allowed to sort of rent all it in to continue to import Coca into the country to make Coca-Cola, even though we're sending plans to go over there and destroy it. And also, Coca-Cola is infamous in South and Central America for assassinating their leaders and their factories. There's a lot of documentation at killercoke.org um, for all of the very famous things that they've been doing. Now, here we see these um, these are hired mercenary uh, gun beetles, and they're rolling up the bodies of ants that were killed in the genocide. Because if people don't leave their land, there's, there's some folks that don't leave their land, um, and they are forced out by hired mercenaries. Now, when we went to Colombia, we spoke to a lot of people about the genocide and about all of like in the middle of the night violence happening in these towns. This the whole town happened. People were mysteriously forced to leave their land. was doing it, and they. Uh, we used to have a machine gun, but the people in Colombia said, actually, one we spoke to said, it's more appropriate for you to put a chainsaw in it is your preferred weapon of choice. 